Okay, I see our attendees uh, coming in. So we'll give um, uh, a moment or two for everyone to um, enter the event here. If you're just joining us, we're just giving everyone um, just a moment to uh, register, well, um, to enter the, um, the Zoom room here. So we can start it in just a, a minute here. Okay, I've got some more folks coming in. So let's look at getting started at 6.02. So just another moment and then we'll, we'll get going with our presentation. Okay. Let's get started. Um, good evening and welcome to Milwaukee Public Library. My name is Kelly, the library's adult programming coordinator, and my co-host this evening is Amy, the adult services librarian at Good Hope Branch. Tonight, we welcome Austin Reese and Rachel Sauer from Lotus Legal Clinic, who will share insight into Lotus Legal's advocacy for trafficked individuals in the Midwest and the power of the arts for survivors throughout this journey. A little um, background information on our host this evening, Rachel Sattler, JD, is the senior managing attorney at Lotus Legal Clinic, where she and her colleagues provide free legal representation to survivors of gender-based violence who need help enforcing your civil rights. Rachel is also a co-founder and president of Dane County Multi-Agency Center um, Incorporated, a nonprofit that streamlines access to existing support services for survivors of gender-based violence through collaborative coordinated care. And Dr. Austin Reese is Director of Survivor Empowerment at Lotus Legal Clinic, lecturer in philosophy at Mount Mary University, and a poet. At Lotus Legal, he develops and implements trauma-informed humanities-based educational programming for survivors of sexual violence and human trafficking. And he edits Untold Stories, a literary magazine that publishes survivor writings alongside visual art responses from the community. Um, so there will be a Q&A at the end of their presentation. So uh, please hold on to your questions and, uh, until we reach that point in the program. Um, and just make sure your microphones are muted and feel free to um, use the Q&A. If you're thinking of questions during the presentation, you can just um, submit them in, um, in the box there. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Austin and Rachel. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, Thank you for inviting us to, to do this presentation and for putting this all together. Um, I'm Austin, and um, I want to just start this presentation off with, with a reading. Um, and oh, let's see here. There we go. And um, in particular, it's a poem titled Part of the Ascension Process. It's a poem by Hannah Linzo who's a survivor of sex trafficking and a client of, of Lotus. Um, this particular poem I'm about to read is, uh, was recently published in uh, Lotus Legal's um, Untold Stories magazine, autumn 2021, issue number four. There's a link to it. Uh, I believe everyone will get a copy of this presentation, uh, recording of this presentation. So you can, if you're curious, you can click on the link. And also I would, I would urge you to consider supporting Hannah's Patreon page, where she um, publishes uh, much of her writing. So, the poem. A goddess I know told me that she let her growing pains be and accepted them. She said they were part of her ascension process, part of growing into herself, so she protected them. She protected these pains because without them, 
the growth would take longer. She held them. She respected these pains because with them, the growth would be stronger. What happens when we don't respect our own pain? We can't really respect anyone else's, can we? What happens when we neglect our own pain? We can't really neglect our healing, our whole self, can we? What is the cost of the avoidance, the disembodiment, and the self-neglect? How do we nurture our dignity and our health if we torture, ignore, and stigmatize ourselves? What will become of our self-respect? Why do we choose the numbness, the disconnect? Why do we chase others just to avoid ourselves? And why do we chase power? Because we live in a paranoid hell. And the type of transformation I am seeking, it rests in the energy. It exists beyond speaking. It exists in the quietly knowing ourselves well. It exists in the realm of magic. Cast this metamorphosis with, metamor with metaphors and spit. You can cast it, cast it in a spell. And the magic resides in the knowing ourselves well. And the tragic cannot thrive while we are growing ourselves well. We can be elastic, but not conniving. And the moves might be drastic when I'm the one driving. So maybe it's best if I'm a passenger riding. If the, move, if the movement is a house, I could be the siding. My role doesn't have to be explosive or exciting. I'll just calmly tend to the fires I'm igniting. And you probably won't catch me on the front lines, but that doesn't mean I'm not fighting. I might be at home running, writing blunt rhymes, but that doesn't mean that I'm hiding. If you look for me, you'll find me, the grounded and alive me. If you look for me, you'll find me writing. Thanks for opening up with that, Austin. Um, I think that this is a perfect reflection of the value of exploring art um, in processing trauma. And in the work that I do as a lawyer um, in the justice system, we have a preconceived plan for how survivors are supposed to talk about their experience um, in order for us to help them. And that is always contrived and it's always in words. We expect survivors to tell us and to use certain words to describe what they've experienced so that we can help them. And what I've learned in my work as a lawyer, um, as an advocate for survivors of trafficking and other types of crime, is that all too often, that is not the most effective or the best way for any particular survivor to reflect on and articulate what they've experienced. Um, and so what we're doing at Lotus is trying to explore new ways for survivors to um, process and think about and talk about what they've experienced so we can adapt our practices to better support them. Um, and before Austin talks more about that work, I just wanna take a few moments to um, explain not only what Lotus does in more detail, but also um, talk a little bit about what trafficking actually is. Um, because we don't want to presume that anyone knows um, in the audience what human trafficking is and um, the impact of that on our community. So very briefly, human trafficking is defined in two ways. First, there is sex trafficking. And our laws, as written, um, say that Sex trafficking is a commercial sex act that is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. And then also we have labor trafficking. 
And that is defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of Ford force, fraud, or coercion, but for the purposes of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And sex trafficking and labor trafficking have been a global public health crisis for um, essentially <laughs> the beginning of humanity, um, but it is certainly getting, has been receiving much due attention in recent years. I would note that oftentimes discussions about human trafficking are really focused on the sex trafficking um, component. And while it is really important that um, our communities respond effectively to sex trafficking, um, not only in um, supporting survivors of sex trafficking, but we also need to spend equal focus and attention on labor trafficking, which is also really insidious and really harmful um, and has um, its tentacles in many, many different industries as well. So, in both of those definitions, the focus is really on um, force, fraud, and coercion. And that can take on different forms. Um, force, for example, might look like a violent assault or um, beatings or confinement or forcefully taking someone's identifying information and passport or depriving people of food and basic necessities. Fraud is when a trafficker promises, for example, a good job or a home or an education. Um, sometimes those promises might take the form of love or companionship and essentially um, are fraudulently promising some type of better life. And then with coercion, that might look like threats to a person or their family or a pet, um, isolation, psychological and emotional abuse, debt bondage, um, sleep deprivation, and also withholding of legal documents. And um, essentially then the trafficked individual is trapped with their trafficker. We find trafficking survivors all over our community. Um, sex trafficking survivors are often found working in commercial sex, massage parlors, residential brothels, um, in the sex tourism industry, escort services, um, hostess clubs, in exotic dancing clubs um, or in the pornography industry. While labor trafficking, um, we might find labor people who are being trafficked in agriculture, construction, um, domestic servitude, factories, um, day labor and gardening, magazine sales, nail salons, care homes, and food processing plants. And the impact of trafficking um, is extraordinarily um, traumatizing in a variety of ways for survivors. And it can be very difficult to, um, to escape that life and escape their trafficker. Um, and it can also then be very difficult to find trauma-informed resources that holistically support the um, varying needs that survivors have when they are trying to um, remove themselves from the trafficking circumstances. I uh, want to also be sure to make clear that oftentimes trafficking survivors might identify um, not as trafficking survivors at first, um, but as survivors of different types of crime, like domestic violence um, or sexual assault. Poly victimization is really common um, amongst um, trafficking survivors. 
And I hope that gives you sort of a general understanding of the population with whom Lotus Legal Clinic is engaging. And Lotus Legal Clinic um, has a unique approach to providing support to survivors. The goal is to ensure that we are not simply um, narrowly providing legal support to survivors, but also more broadly empowering survivors through um, our advocacy work in policy and our um, community education that we are doing. And we also then do provide direct legal services to survivors. And we provide those legal services for free um, to victims of all forms of human trafficking, regardless of gender identity or immigration status, um, ability to pay, age, race, or ethnicity. Um, and in addressing sort of the legal issues, we um, also have the survivor empowerment component of our clinic, which is designed to offer a, an opportunity for survivors to explore different ways um, to think about and talk about their experience. And with that, Austin, um, I'll turn it over to you uh, to discuss that important work. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. So in terms of survivor empowerment, um, Lotus's two um, sister programs, Untold Stories and Rise and Thrive, help survivors to collaborate and, and generate um, literary and visual art to tell their story and speak their truth which in turn provides an opportunity for personal healing, human connection, and community awareness. At Lotus, we believe that catharsis through art is a necessary part of a holistic approach to working with survivors. And you can see here on the screen, um, some of the key components that are a part of this sort of year long programming through Untold Stories and Rise and Thrive. So, um, in both cases, um, there are a series of creative uh, writing workshops where um, myself and an, invi and an um, invi invited uh, co-facilitator will um, lead the participants through a series of writing prompts. Um, and when we're doing this and we're creating um, you know, poetry and, and we're critiquing it together, sharing our stories, uh, we have with us um, licensed therapists from um, uh, Bloom Center for Art and Integrated Therapies. Um, uh, we have them on site uh, um, in case you know someone needs to be um, supported in that way. Um, and the workshops sometimes they're they're smaller, three hour affairs, and then we have um, the 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 intensive uh, two day um, workshop usually over the weekend that we do in the fall. Um, after after the um, you know initial workshop, um, we then have follow up sessions on an individual basis, where I can again um, help with the storytelling, get to know the, the client better, um, give us some feedback. You know um, uh, what I call playing with language together. We play with language. And we we, and we get we get the poem to where they want it to be, um, and then. Usually in the early spring, what will happen is we'll, 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 we'll reach out to the community. Um, this particular, this upcoming spring, um, we have a service learning project through the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And um, six uh, wonderful art students will, um, will meet weekly with me. And they will, after spending some time learning about trauma studies and, and Lotus Legal, um, they will get to choose uh, one or two or three poems written by our clients in the workshops 
to then create response artworks to. And obviously this is sort of one of those, you know, interesting experiences, maybe unique and rare in the sense that there's vulnerability. There's also the sense of co-creation and it can be really, really exciting. Um, and, and so, yeah, so that happens with, with the students. We also, and with Rise and Thrive in particular, we reach out to um, professional artists as well. Um, we've, we've worked with a, an amazing landscape painter. We've worked with a filmmaker. We've worked, we're currently working with um, the talented uh, Mariel Alshwang, uh, who is a music artist. And so that's a big part of it. We want to collaborate, you know, relationships, networks. We want, we want that um, to be part of the task of being uh, vulnerable and the, and the task of being, um, you know, able to connect with other people. And so um, once, the, once the artwork is all completed, um, we have various ways which we try to get it out into the community. So we'll, we'll have, say, for example, a poetry reading. Um, and we might have the artworks, you know, on easels um, uh, around the, the speaker. We've also just had um, straight up art, art exhibitions uh, in a proper art gallery with um, the writing on the wall and, um, and, the, and, the, and the paintings, artworks on the wall as well. And so those can be, I, ho I hope, very you know, inclusive community events um, that allow the, um, the client, the survivor to, to share the story, to you know, create change through their voices. Um, and uh, we also have um, kind of like a culminating showcase event for both Untold Stories and Rise and Thrive. And, um, and that's a, a chance for, you know, a lot of people to get together and get to, get to meet the, the, the writers. The writers can invite, you know, um, family and friends. And, and we just have an event to really celebrate them and have some really wonderful experiences of poetry and food and art and um yeah so uh recently it's been, some of these have been virtual but um but we actually have a, a concert fundraiser coming up in may for the rise and thrive showcase which will feature marielle marielle alshwing and it will be at the cooperage in milwaukee so this will also be a fundraiser for lotus so i'm um, highly encourage you to check that out uh, we would love to have you and we would obviously appreciate your support um Another thing that comes out at the end of the process that I work pretty much all summer on is, is a literary magazine. We, we now have um, our, our own literary magazine, which um, I would say, you know, it's, it's really evolved in the last three years, but now we have, you know, it has its own, um, you know, barcode and ISSN number and, and we try to make it um, as beautiful as we can. And we publish it through Paragon printers. And it's something that, Again, we'll, you know, have a visual, I can, you know, I got one right here in my hands here, but you can see we try to make it beautiful and then basically um, we will, we would have um, a poem, the poem and then the art response side by side um, in, in this, you know, uh, magazine. And I think, you know, it's, it's really one of the tangible products that we can provide to the clients who, in, you know, and get the, and get into to libraries and bookstores and get get into the hands of the people to again to, to get to know these stories and to, and to raise awareness about you know trafficking and um, sexual violence and, and their aftermath. So that's really exciting. So if you know if you're interested in, in checking the magazines out there on the website as well, lotuslegal.org. Um, and then for the first time uh, this year, we're going to have. Um, an actual music album, um, a four, four song EP that is going to be uh, songs created by Marielle that, that were made in, uh, in, in relationship with and in response to the artworks, um, the, uh, the poetry of, of clients. So, so that's kind of a general overview of just kind of the type of things that are involved um, in, in this kind of programming that we do. So I'm gonna stop this sharing there. Um, so, oh. Austin, can I just ask a question? Um, yeah. You know, what do, can you talk a little bit about what the actual workshop looks like, or are you planning yeah. on hitting that later? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm getting there right now. Okay, great. I'll get into some nuts and bolts here. So that was kind of the overview and, um, and 
uh, I'll say this much and, and kind of give you a little bit more insight into the, to the, to the reality of the workshops. Um, in the untold stories writing workshops I've developed during my tenure at Lotus Legal, um, you know, we try to address the lived experiences um, of anxiety, depression, and, and what I call arrested time that often affects survivors of sexual trauma and explore how poetry is well suited to address some of the effects of these debilitating states. Um, for the survivor, the demands of writing poetry, of creating uh, worlds with words that bring about a brief, intense agreement of feeling between writer and reader are always vulnerable to the darker demands of one's own memory. And yet the possibility of taking the abusive marks from a tra traumatic past and writing them down as expressive marks on the page remains. What comes of this encounter with poetry cannot be determined in advance. Um, each writer and reader must co-create the meaning of the poem together through empathy and imagination, which requires caring enough to do the work of paying attention to language and to one another in ways not often practiced in everyday life. It is perhaps worth noting, I think, that the word cure is, uh, is a descendant of the, uh, the word cura, which is the, uh, the Latin word for care. And perhaps in just this small way, the caring required of poetry is a kind of momentary curative that stops the poison, the trauma, um, the poison in the, in the wound, the trauma from spreading. Um, so uh, in a workshop, I, it's a ritual um, to have the author, after they've had time to create some, some new work, to have the author read their uh, newly written poem and then without pause or applause to hear it uh, read again by someone else in the circle. Um, this is not a simple echo, but a moment where two voices can come to recognize each other despite their different cadences, intonations, and timbers to co-create the meaning of the poem. Then with the author remaining uh, as a silent listener, the group discusses what they notice and find effective in the poem and what resonates with them on a personal level. After the discussion, the author is then invited to give the last word, which might involve um, providing additional context, providing their interpretation of the poem, um, answering any questions from the group, or just sharing their feelings in that moment. Um, it's my view that at the heart of sexual trauma is a kind of a solipsism, which is to say kind of this, this painful isolation and distrust of the world. Um, but this practice of double reading holds a space, I think, where the traumatized person's own self-image is returned through the living other, revitalized by their breath. Um, in a way, I think poetry uh, might be likened to a form of CPR that breathes into, literally inspires, breathes into both uh, writer and reader to help each other be heard and understood. Um, if a poem is a gesture towards home, um, which is an idea found in uh, Jericho Brown's um, Poetry and Poetics, then I would argue it's also a carrying of the body weighted down with scars and skin that forever leaves the body exposed to what wounds it. The body in turn is carried from within by breath, the inspiration and expiration, uh, the diastole and systole of the heart beating softly against the lining of one's own skin. Poetry, at least in my mind, at its most basic is um, breath made manifest on the page by means of language. This kind of poetic carrying is expressed in various ways. It happens through the work of metaphor, which I think is one of the key um, aspects of, of poetry. Um, so through metaphor, uh, which is itself a kind of carrying beyond, metaphora means carrying beyond, or transfer of meaning that occurs when seemingly disparate or different things are, are discovered to possess shared properties circulating between them. I think of a line from poet um, Edna, Edna St. Vincent Millay, where she writes, my heart has a stone in its shoe. It also happens through the way the poem carries the heart of the writer who carries the weight of their traumatic past on their back that stretches back before their own birth 
via intergenerational trauma. Um, this last image of poetic carrying, um, I liken to a particular sculpture of the, uh, uh, the figure of, of, of Aeneas in, in, in ancient history. Aeneas fleeing from the, from the burning of his city, of his whole world, while carrying his own father on his back, who can't, who can't continue. And, and the father himself is carrying a vessel containing the ashes of their ancestors. And there's movement, there's movement in life in this carrying, I would, I would say, even if it's only a single step with ashes in one's hands and flames at, one, flames at one's feet. Um, I just wanna show you briefly just this, this image that I'm referring to um, and then I wanna share with you a writing prompt. Let's see here, so let's see if you can see that. So this uh, is in the Borghese um, Gallery in Rome. And you can see here um, this this figure, um, a younger figure standing, and we know from the story found in um, in the Aeneid that uh, again the city has been ransacked. It's been it's been it's burning to the ground. People are are are, are traumatized and dying, and and he's again he's carrying his own father in, in Caesar's on his back, um, and in Caesar's there you can see he's holding this shrine. Um, that contains the the ashes of the ancestors. So in a way, I think um, all of our programming, in a way, it really explores and examines what it means to carry the burden of trauma, and, and in some ways, how to share that burden. Um, no, getting into an actual uh, writing prompt, um, I just wanted to share with you. One in particular that I'm, I think works particularly well. And um, this is one of those prompts where um, I encourage you, you know, to try this at home if you want to and, and see what you make of it. Um, but basically, I mean, the background for this prompt is the idea that, um, you know, in many, in many cases I hear that, that survivors feel stuck in their lives, a uh, stuck, um, in the past, tethered to an overwhelming, overwhelmingly painful experience that continues to interrupt their daily lives in the present. And due to this, of course, many survivors of trauma suffer bouts of depression. Depressives sometimes lose their sense of wonder and curiosity about the future, as they are certain nothing good will come out of the future for them, only more pain and disappointment. The creative, uh, the creative writing prompt I call Time Travel Collage is an exercise for helping survivors of sexual trauma and human trafficking get unstuck by allowing them to use their imaginations and their memory to move in and out of time, past, present, future, and even to step outside of time in some way by contemplating eternal sounding truths. So the prompt itself is simple enough. I ask participants to write a few lines uh, of significant firsts in their lives and significant lasts in their lives to engage with the past. Um, like the last time you saw your father, the last time you saw your mother, the first time you left home, those kind of things. Um, and then I asked them to write a few lines of, 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 of significant things going on um, in their life, in the here and now to engage with the present. And that can be through what they're perceiving, what they're, what they're feeling and so on. Who's in their life right now? How, how do they make them feel? And then I asked them to write a few lines of significant things that they um, hope or expect uh, will happen in the future. Um, and I think this can take, you know, be very concrete, it could be more like, a, like an aspiration, a dream, a vision. Um, but of course, this is to engage with the future. And then finally, I asked them to write a few lines that express um, timeless sounding truths in a way to engage with a kind of, of an eternity or a kind of timelessness. Um, and once they've had time to write these different lines for all these different aspects of time, um, I ask them to weave all of the individual pieces together, all the, the lines together into a poem so that it moves between past, present, future, and, and timelessness. I encourage them to shuffle the lines around to see what flows best and see what sounds best. And they're really just, there are no rules of what goes where. 
Um, so what I'm calling collage here is actually the writing technique of um, a writing technique called parataxis. Um, a paratactic poem is one that frees the writer from needing to construct a narrative that flows from start to finish and ends in some kind of epiphany or resting place. Um, I think it also helps to lessen the anxiety that overwhelms uh, some clients before the, the act of writing itself, when I give them time to, to go off on their own. Um, and sometimes their thoughts scatter and they can't even think of you know, a coherent theme or a, uni a unified approach to the poem. They can't even get started. Um, but I think this, this kind of prompt helps with that. And I think it accomplishes these things because its focus is on conjunction and instead of connection. So like, instead of before and after, it's some kind of narrative flow. It can be this and this, and they can be unrelated. It's a placing uh, words and sentences side by side um, that do not have an obvious link to one another or that make you work really hard to imagine a link. Um, I think one of the results of this, of this paratactic approach is that it can defamiliarize language in its everyday usage, which in turn, uh, I think, can interrupt harmful patterns of thought and feeling and that routinized conformity of our everyday exchanges with other people. I think it, it's, it's, it deepens the discourse. It does create this you know, brief but intense agreement of feeling that I think is rare. I don't think it happens all the time. And I think um, not only writing poetry, but then being in, that, in the presence of others who then read, read it back to you and you talk about it. Um, I think this can be very intense, but very, very, very meaningful in ways that normal human exchanges in the everyday don't quite um, get at. But ultimately, I think that I think the client um, in the workshop space is allowed to kind of sort of freely uh, write towards surprise and the possibility of relating to themselves and to one another in, uh, in new and unexpected ways. And so for me, I, I usually focus on poetry because in a way it's, 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 it's so intensive, it's so compact that there's this explosion of associations that can happen in the poem. And I think that those, those associations that are kind of implied or, or in, in between lines, um, they, they draw the reader in um, to actually do some work and to tease out things and to really imagine for themselves what is trying to be said here. And I think the association that can happen then that all of a sudden this person says, wait a minute, I, I think I know what you're talking about. It makes me think of this or that. And, um, and there's a really interesting conversation ensues. Um, and it all started with um, writing a short poem and reading it and sharing it. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do in workshop. We'll have, um, you know, a chance to have that prompt, for example, and then they can write and share. Um, and then we'll have another prompt and, and on the intensive uh, workshop weekend, you know, it's all seven hours uh, of prompts and sharing. And then there's a, an overnight assignment of another prompt. And then on uh, Sunday, we have um, a really, a really amazing art therapy session with the, with the therapist. And then we have more prompts. And, and then by the end, you know, they all have, uh, I think, a handful of poems that, that, have been, that have begun in a meaningful way that they can then think about and, and revise or expand upon uh, over the coming um, weeks and months. Um, and sometimes they'll, they'll get together in writing groups. Of course, um, they meet one-on-one -on -one with me as well. So, um, you know, yeah, they, I think they learn some, something about writing and, and writing poetry, for example, but I think they really learn just um, how to express these untold stories. And I think in a way they're untold because they're so traumatic. Um, you know, there's many different ways to conceive of, of what trauma is. I mean, it's literally, literally a wound um, and catharsis is a kind of like a purging, the poison from the wound. But I think trauma also is a sense of sort of this, this what I would call an inexperienced experience. Meaning that someone has gone through something so painful, um, maybe so identity shattering, um, so overwhelmingly um, so much overwhelming suffering that they can't, they, they'll experience it, they can't fully experience it. Um, and so there's different types of, uh, you know, avoidance and 
repression and all these kind of things. And so it's hard to talk about these things. I think that's the very nature of trauma. Um, and so that's the hope that someone, you know, maybe who needs obviously very practical, important um, legal services can also find a place where they can get um, other kinds of support too. Um, and I think just that human connection, you know, empathy, and, and just kind of having a platform to, to develop their stories and share them. Um, it's just something we, we, we value and we, and we hope, um, you know, makes a small impact um, on this issue. And of course, in every single client and every person who, who gets, to, gets, to, gets to know that client. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, Austin, I just wanted to add, you know, so many of my, my clients on the legal side of thing, you know, when we are talking about their options within the justice system and, and how they can articulate what had happened, what's happened to them. I so frequently hear my clients say, but like, I don't even know where to begin. Like there aren't words for this. And, um, I think what's so beautiful about your programming is that um, you offer any survivor an opportunity to come as they are. Um, these are people who may not have any writing experience um, and are of all different education levels and backgrounds. And um, it's an opportunity, to, it's a freedom um, that they don't have on the legal side of things, um, where they're so constrained in um, in the words they can use and the breadth of what they can talk about. I am curious also, uh, I think probably members of the audience might be curious to, to know a little bit more about how you navigate um, a group of writers that come from such different backgrounds um, and um, have such varying um, experiences in in poetry specifically. Yeah, great question, um, Rachel. And I think part of it is in the beginning sort of stages of the workshop where I, you know there's kind of a, an application process and there's a lot of questions I ask uh, which I think are the types of questions that kind of allow me to get a sense of where this person is at in their life, what they've been through, what what kind of things they're looking for in a writing workshop. Um, so that helps. Uh, a deal, uh, I think a big a big part of it um, is starting with that. But then I, you know, the workshops themselves, that because they're so intensive, we like to keep the group um, small. Um, you know, we've done some as you know four, six, eight um, participants, but that way you know, we all have plenty of space and sometimes it's just space to be silent. And, you know, it, I, I, it doesn't always happen exactly this way, but there's, there's usually this on the second day of the workshop, something clicks and there's a real bond that's forged and, you know, hugs and, and tears and, and things happen um, where I think, you know, it's not just about the writing, it's about, about look, look, we're here together, we're in this together, you know, we're here to keep each other afloat. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, myself, we'll, we'll have co-facilitators, we'll have one of my colleagues will be in the room as well. And we're all just there to be, um, to be active listeners and, and to pay attention to them and to help them in any, any way we can. So it's certainly always a unique challenge because every, every group is different, um, different dynamics, but, um, but that's that's the risk and reward, I think, of you know, of kind of getting in um, with all different perspectives. But I think ultimately the the, the variety of perspectives is just is life affirming and life life enhancing for sure. Um, well, I'm looking at the clock here. I think we're right on time to um, to do a Q and A here. Yeah. So if anyone in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask, um, any comments, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A uh, box, which you should see on the bottom of your screen. Um, so go ahead and um, formulate some questions for us. Um, I'm curious, uh, Austin and, and Rachel, um, so, you know, when, when you've got new clients that, uh, I mean, I guess I'm assuming they approach Lotus Legal um, to um, help them out with their situation. Like, do, do a lot of the clients, um, 
typically like want to be um, involved in the arts programs or is it something that they, they're kind of surprised about? Um, or like what, what's your experience as far as, um, uh, what, do the clients do both or do some just kind of stick with the legal help? Yeah, well, first of all, it's important to emphasize that survivors can enter one side or the other and participate in both. Um, um, it, there's no wrong way to get involved. I certainly, you know, we have clients on the legal side. Um, I don't think I've encountered a client yet who um, has been referred to us for legal help who knows about the em empowerment side of things until we start talking about it. Um, usually on the legal side, we're getting referrals from community partners and um, other um, support services for survivors. And the focus is really on um, addressing the myriad legal needs that survivors have. Um, but I imagine Austin would better be able to answer how survivors get connected with him. Well, honestly, uh, you know, the, the, the programming, the, the, the basic gist of, of, of survivor empowerment, you know, began before my time um, with the founder of Lotus, um, Rachel Monaco. And so there was a framework within, within kind of to work, work with it. And I think also there was, a, there was already a number of clients um, involved. And so there is a lot of word of mouth. There's a lot of like, you know, mm -hmm. survivors meeting other survivors and saying, you know, this worked well for them. Um, and I think that's kind of the main, main thing. We do try to send out some, you know, some things through social media and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, we're still, you know, a relatively small nonprofit and we're, we are trying to grow awareness of what we do. And I think um, this type of presentation again, we're so thankful to be a part of is, is, is a way to kind of uh, do that and, and hopefully get people interested in, in, in our programming. And the clients who I've referred to the survivor empowerment programming, oftentimes it's, you know, we deal with the legal system and my clients are really dissatisfied with how the justice system treated them and um, don't feel heard, don't feel like they were able to express themselves the way they want to express themselves and ask me, well, what do I do now? This is it. This is over. What do what happens now? And um, it's been really, I think, helpful for me to be able to say, well, here's this resource. Um, and no, you don't you don't need to know the first thing about writing or poetry <laughs> to participate, but it's a tool for you to um, explore alternative ways to elevate your voice and um, speak about what you've experienced. I have a question, Austin. I'm wondering if two things. Um, if you have an, uh, out of these workshops, if you have an ongoing group, that's one question. And the other is, you might not know the answer to this, but when you are doing these groups and you've got people reading each other's works and experiencing each other, do you know if some of them have kind of formed their own kind of community um, after that? Great, great questions. Thank you, Amy. Um, I definitely have uh, uh, a handful of, 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 of clients who say maybe three years ago, uh, we're in a workshop and a showcase and did a poetry reading. Um, and they um, will still um, attend events and they will um, sometimes they, they'll attend a second or third workshop as well. And, um, and of course, you know, I, I always love to have these one on one kind of sessions where we can just kind of catch up and play with language together and I can see what they're working on. And sometimes they just want to, you know, they need another prompt. They like, you know, to give me something to work on. So um, give them something to work on. So that, so yeah, definitely some, some really wonderful people who, who, who stayed with us um, and come back for more. And I think amongst the, amongst the, a particular say, cohort um, of a workshop, um, there has been some really wonderful connections and, and, and relationships made where 
they they might you know maybe three or four start their own reading group or they they they'll get together and have lunch, you know, and and just you know have some conversation together. So that definitely happens, you know. But honestly, there's there's some people who come in and and they're not ready for that and they don't want that. They, they just want to come in, focus on you know their story and then and then do something else. So we respect that too. So it's really, you, the, I think the client can make it really whatever they want it to be. Thank you. So there's still time. Um, if anyone in the audience wants to ask some questions, um, just go ahead and drop that in the Q and A. Um, I have another question, uh, kind of going back to um, some of uh, Rachel's presentation earlier, just talking about like the landscape of trafficking. Um, I was really surprised um, at your description of uh, labor trafficking. I, you know, I think when um, you know there are presentations on trafficking, it's um, the conversation is primarily you know sex trafficking, um, and you know I know Milwaukee and Wisconsin are um, particularly um, high number states um, for um, this crisis. Um, you know. I, I wonder if, you know, maybe some people in the audience are kind of wondering, like, you know, what, what can we do? Like, how can we help? Um, you know, are there things to look out for? Um, you know, uh, ways to volunteer? Kind of what, what would you um, say to someone that wants to help? Yeah, gr great question. Um, you know, this, this is sort of the underbelly of society, um, this trafficking um, cycle. And it is certainly really just important to remain vigilant and aware. Um, and if, for example, you're reading news stories about um, particular businesses where employees may not be treated very well, um, those are the sorts of red flags of um, potential trafficking um, in the labor field and in the labor side of things. And I would encourage um, our community members to be cognizant of where they're doing business. And um, that can be impactful. Um, obviously, in a capitalist society, um, how we spend our money um, can make a big difference, but it is really difficult to identify survivors of trafficking, um, particularly labor trafficking. They, it's difficult to locate them physically. Oftentimes they're being housed um, off the beaten track in hotels or trailers um, and exploitation can really take place in isolated communities, including rural communities um, where people are more spread out. And then in urban areas, um, trafficked survivors are often in insulated communities. And then um, in labor trafficking, there are all sorts of other barriers that make it harder for uh, um, trafficking survivors to come forward. Maybe that's their culture or the language, immigration status, um, a lack of knowledge of workers' rights and laws, um, and just generally fear. Um, so it's you know, hard to volunteer in this area because um, it, these are industries, um, valid industries. So I would say with labor trafficking, the best way um, to support survivors is to make sure you are doing business with companies that um, are providing, that you know are supportive of their workers. I need to unmute. We have a question in um, the question is that you might have addressed this, but do you work with children under and under 18 year olds? Thank you. Yes, we do on the legal side of things. Um, age does not matter. Um, we provide free representation to survivors of all ages. And Austin, on the survivor empowerment side, um, do, what are what does your programming look like for youth? Um, well, our, our clients, um, you know, a good percentage of them, uh, you know, were children um, when they experienced their, their trafficking. And so um, the way it's worked so far is that the clients who've come to me are all, you know, 17, 18 and older. Um, so it's just, there hasn't been a case presented to me of, of someone 
of, of young, uh, younger than that. But, you know, I wanted to piggyback off what Rachel said before too, that, you know, like what, like what can you do? I mean, that, it's, it's overwhelming to think about sometimes, but I think, you know, I mean, one thing that comes to mind immediately is, you know, just paying attention to each other. I, I, obviously I try to stress that in, in the, how, how the poetry workshop kind of runs this, this kind of, you know, paying attention to language and to one another. But I think, you know, if you see something, say something, um, and it's okay, you know, it's okay to, 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 to get, um, involved in some sense in the issue or, you know, again, to, to support uh, groups like Lotus and other, other ones in the community. I think, um, you know, it can be as simple as again, purchasing a magazine as well. Um, everything that comes in is either through grants or donations at Lotus and it all goes right back in, in, into direct, um, uh, programming direct client services to survivors so obviously we're a, we're a small nonprofit, and you know we just need we need your support and i think um you know if you want to go to our website please check that out as well but ultimately at the end of the day um i just think i think paying attention um and and maybe you know asking someone you know what what, what is your story like you know, I don't know you, and but I'm, I'm I'm curious, and I'd love to love to know more about you. Yeah, there are a lot of really extraordinary organizations that are doing the really hard work of um, connecting with survivors of trafficking and building those connections is um, a long term effort. It takes a lot to find survivors and then to make sure that they feel comfortable um, and that you are a person and an organization that can be trusted um, and to help them understand or make sense of their experience um, in order to determine, you know, whether they were trafficked or not as well. So I, yeah, Austin's right. Um, you can support those organizations that are doing that really important work. I also just want to say that if there's anyone in the audience, um, you know, if you think you might be interested in our services, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're here for you. Um, and if you know anybody that you think could use um, some help in this area, please, um, you know, refer them to us as well. So. Um, we're, we're here and with, with, you know, all this virtual technology, we can, we can be pretty flexible. Um, and we want to, we want to help. Um, can you just repeat again, um, the address of the Lotus Legal Clinic website? Yeah, it's just www.lotuslegal.org. So Lotus, L-O-T-U-S, legal. L E G A L dot O R G. Well, Rachel and Austin, I just want to thank you both so much um, for your time and for your stories and for sharing you know, all the great work that Lotus Legal is doing um, for survivors and for our communities. Um, and I just want to uh, also thank everyone that um, attended this evening. Um, you know, I hope. You learned something. I hope um, you're inspired to action. I hope you're inspired to support. Um, and you know, I just thank you both too for um, having such a great message of um, you know trust and understanding um, that you know, we should have for each other, um, especially right now. You know, obviously in this pandemic environment, we're all um, isolated in various ways, so it's it's that much more important. Um, so thanks to everyone. Um, uh, uh, please uh, feel free to visit the library's website as well uh, at mpl.org. Um, you can check out our online calendar of lots of events coming up over the next few months. Um, uh, you can usually just register online. If you have any questions, you can contact the library as well. Um, so thanks and um, stay safe out there and have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye.